Hello, and welcome to another edition of Storytelling on Orchard Street. I'm your host, Pete Salamita. We are in the PT Knitwear Bookstore on Orchard Street. And with me is Begonia Plaza Rosenbluth. She is a writer, a theater, film, and television actor, a filmmaker, a singer, a yogi, and mother. Her play, Teresa's Ecstasy, premiered off-Broadway at the Cherry Lane Theater in New York City. Her latest docu-fiction film, Souvenir Views, premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. Her work is published in Broadway Play Publishings, Inc., and her poems are featured in silver-tongued devil anthology, Rhymes of the Ancient Mariner, which I have right here. <laughs> Give that a little bit of a plug. Very good. It's a terrific book. And Beyond Words Magazine. The right launch and her short story, Dali-esque Apides, is narrated at the Literary Arcade on YouTube. Begonia lives in New York City with her husband, and welcome to the program. Did I get everything right there? <laughs> Definitely. Cool. The right launch is uh, another magazine. Oh, okay. I have another poem published. Cool. Um, Maybe just bring the mic just a little bit yeah. closer to you. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Well, first so and foremost, I just want to thank you for well, sure. inviting me here. Um, this is very cool. Yes. Orchard Street is a place where I've been in the past many times, um, but I did a one-woman show here on uh, at um, Nada Theater. Okay. So that was many, many moons ago. Right. Uh, You're a very busy person. We have a lot to talk about, but I want to make sure that um, we start off with a story. Is it recently written? Yes, I wrote it uh, specifically to celebrate um, La Passionaria, and um, it's her birthday, and I would, I just felt like dedicating her some words. Awesome, she, uh, that's, you must be a great friend. <laughs> um, it's called the passion, the passionate passion flower. Yes. Okay, and um, without any further ado. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the passionate passion flower. I learned about Dolores Ibarruri, or the Passionaria, as she became known the world over, the Passionate One, or the Passion Flower in English, back in 19, 1990, when invited to perform her farewell speech of November 1st, 1938, to the International Brigades in Barcelona, Spain. It was on February 25th that a dinner celebration for the 53rd anniversary of the Abraham Lincoln Brigades would be held in San Francisco, California. Though I was mainly an actor, I had recently dedicated one year to making a documentary film, Guernica Lives, about the bombing of Guernica, my father's hometown, where the Nazi regime tried out their first aerial attacks prior to World War II on April 26, 1937. This is approximately two years after Hitler had attained complete power and four years after the first concentration camp was built in Dachau. Anyway, when some of the Lincoln vets saw my very personal film, they invited me to participate alongside the actor John Randolph and author Isabel Allende and other activist artists to reenact Passionaria's words. The first time I read her words, I immediately fell in love with her. She transported me to a time of life-affirming struggle for facts, when courage was imminent because, like she exclaimed so eloquently, better to die fighting on your feet than to live on your knees. During the Spanish Civil War and World War II, Dolores Ibarruri was the leader of the Communist Party in Spain. In the context of that murderous fascist world, it was the natural evolution for a woman so uniquely committed and completely consumed with fighting injustice and oppression. She mobilized Spanish loyalist faction to defend democracy and bonded everyone together in solidarity whose mission was to realize dignity for all. She wrote and delivered incendiary radio and live speeches, and her bold articles in liberal papers became known throughout the world for the truths that she communicated with such rational verbosity. Remember that fascism disdains enlightenment ideals of rationalism, the very foundation 
of America's democracy. After my performance reading, audience members of who were American men and women veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigades rushed over to me with tears in their eyes and oozing with emotion once again by Pasionaria's words 52 years later, blurting out their memories. With amazing detail, they described Dolores Ibarruri motivating the dejected and frightened crowds with her resilient optimism. Try to remember the pain of defeat and having to leave our Spanish comrades behind, knowing that a fascist dictator was about to storm Barcelona, and all of us crying and embracing each other, with Pasionaria's voice reverberating throughout the street over loud speakers. It was the most emotional day of my life, said an elderly woman who had served as a young volunteer nurse. Today, December 9, 2022, I want to pay tribute to your 127th birthday, beloved Passionaria. My reverence for your heroism has only deepened over the years, and perhaps because I sense, hear, and see the demonic fascist cloud of repression and intimidation returning most venomously. For me, you represent Spain's and a vital piece of the world's 20th century history, in my eyes, you are a legendary leader for your mythological courage, overcoming horrendous life struggles, and teaching us that moral and ethical character is innately necessary for the evolution of mankind. Without affectation, you always acted humanely and in alignment with our exalting words, with your exalting words, standing up to power. Already as a little girl, you were precocious, and carefully paid attention to the contradictory behaviors of people in superior roles who were motivated by greed, prejudice, and an exploitative underlying dismissiveness for the underclass. You came from the most wretched, humble beginnings, born in Gallarta, the Bay of Biscay, province of Vizcaya, in Euskadi, where its countryside is mostly foggy, rainy, and fertile. Three of Euskadi's provinces pertain to the north of Spain and two belong to the south of France, a uniquely untraceable culture with a language and genealogy indigenous only to its habitat. Basques are fierce like their mountainous land and wild Cantabrian sea. Passionaria, you were born between steep rocky mountain ranges on one side of the Nervion River flowing into the Atlantic Ocean. Your green lands were imbued with rich reserves of minerals, copper, lead, zinc, tin, silver, mercury, but mainly steel and iron ore of the highest quality in its soil and subsoil. Though you grew up in the Spanish center of industry and natural wealth, your hardworking parents suffered the trials and tribulations of extreme disadvantage. You were the daughter, sister, niece, granddaughter, and wife of noble but rugged miners. You often remark that though you watched your father work from sun up to sundown, your family barely survived knowing what hunger felt. You pondered over the logic of your life conditions and how was it that Vizcaya's land was so rich with minerals and resources, its people so industrious, and yet they lived crushing, impoverished lives. After fighting the Carlos War, your father went to work at the mine in Somorostro, and there in the mine at 18, he met your mother. After they married, your dad insisted that she stay home to raise the children. You were the eighth of 11 children. Your father was Antonio El Astillero, in charge of preparing the explosions in the mines. Later, you would chuckle, saying that your dad spoke a macaronic Castilian and regularly read to him the daily paper after work. Miners worked under inhumane conditions, soaked in mud, and vulnerable to all, all sorts of life threats. Your grandmother died. Your grandfather died, crushed by a stone of iron. And your mother, who made face coverings for your father's protection so that he wouldn't breathe in the heavy metal pollutants, constantly was worrying that your father might have an accident on the job. And what if he lost his life? She'd be forced to pull you out of school no longer able to afford your, your and your siblings' tuition. So she was always urging you to learn to read and write as quickly as possible, 
which you not only learned, but fell in love with the practice of reading and writing, encouraged by your favorite teacher, and soon began to dream of becoming a teacher yourself, just like her, who in 1937 died in the bombing of Guernica. You grew up in the traditionally devout Catholic home, and you embraced the sectarian teachings until their negative influences no longer made sense and actually offended your intelligence. Huge disappointing betrayals turned you against the church and their supremacist ways of judging and condemning others while avoiding responsibility for their own blatant deceitfulness. With unease, you noticed how entitled foreigners staked out public and private lands and news signposts would appear suddenly displaying strange names like the Franco-Belgian mine, the Orconera iron mines, the Galdames mines, the MacLeanan mine. Families were displaced from their lands and their homes without explanation. My grandparents on my father's side being one of them. You, Passionaria, finally understood that the Basque bourgeoisie and Spanish ruling class had sold out for their own personal self-interest, and the church placated to those ruling classes, while Basque national liberties and centuries-old privileges were unfairly revoked by the government in Madrid. You were scandalized remembering how those foreigners who came and extracted all they could now in time of war when their support was so urgently needed, looked the other way. At 15, you were obliged to quit school and go to work as a domestic and caretaker of a child with tuberculosis. And on your off hours, you studied to become a seamstress. This misfortune ended your dream of becoming a, of becoming a school teacher, devastating you with enormous sorrow. At 20, you married a minor and labor union leader Money was scarce, but you began having children. And while continuing to work from home as a seamstress, you sang around the house and outside in your vegetable patch, holding on to your fervent faith. Because your husband was actively involved working on behalf of the miner's interests, he was targeted and often imprisoned. Despite all your efforts and warm personality, you couldn't make ends meet, nor provide for your children. And out of six, four of your babies died of malnutrition. You weren't able to afford even the coffins to bury them in. The crisis you experienced was so horrific that if it hadn't been for your two surviving children, Amaya and Ruben, you would have happily called it quits. But instead, that calamity became the catalyst for your transformation and finally tired of crying like a weeping victim, you decided to take action and become an agent for change. Terror led you to the local library where you read every book you could get your hands on that would illuminate your understanding of social justice and political reform. You read books on the French Revolution and the end of absolute monarchy in 1789. You read Marx, Engel, Lenin, and learned about how the modern proletariat liberated itself from imperialist Russia in 1917. When your ideas began to take shape and you no longer oscillated between blame and resignation, you set out to reverse the cycle of treachery with a self-empowered will. Heaven no longer was at fault, but man himself. Your first article was for the Basque Miner's paper, and under the pseudonym Passionaria, you wrote about the struggle for life and dignity, titled The Hypocrisy of the Church. Your husband encouraged and inspired you, and together you organized and mobilized until the ever-demanding cause split you physically apart with responsibilities in different locations of Spain, and other times your husband would stay home with the children because the demand for your explosive magnetism became indispensable to Spain's resistance. You were fearless traveling to impoverished areas, assisting the subjugated workers, political prisoners, and anyone repressed. You alleviated others suffering with your support, like a divine mother defending human rights and eliminating shame. 
your writings and speeches continued with intensifying influence, and your involvement in politics came out of an organic indignation with the passive indifference around you. Despite the non-intervention pact in the U.S. maintained with Western countries to not get involved in Spain's war, brave volunteers around understood that Spain's war was everyone's war, and 35,000 volunteers from 52 countries enthusiastically arrived to Spain ready to help hold the line and resist fascism alongside the Republicans, the pro-democratic loyalists, with whatever arms available. Mussolini and Hitler had already been supporting the Franco regime, providing him with weapons, soldiers, manpower, and anything he needed for his demonic destruction. The Spanish loyalists had Mexico support, but they needed more, and Spain had no other choice but to accept the USSRs. Pasionaria, you were instrumental in securing military, medical, and humanitarian aid to thousands of Spanish children, women, and elderly who were evacuated to these two countries on opposite ends of the globe for safety. You went to the Soviet Union and met with Stalin, and there you helped create policies for advancing Spain's mission. And then you returned to Spain and became the editor-in-chief of the newspaper Mundo Obrero and used your position to campaign for the workers, their housing, their land rights, and health conditions of both men and women. And you did all this because I think you needed to defend the dignity of your victimized parents for all the inhumane exploitation that they had suffered. And then the children you lost and the neighbors you saw languish as you did. And that really touches my heart. You even spent time in jail over a year with two children maneuvering with heart and intelligence. You organized the World Committee of Women Against War and Fascism, and as the first delegate attended in 1934 the conference in France. You didn't know, but you were a true pioneering feminist, except you were more of a humanist, propelled by stoic pragmatism. Your No Pasaran slogan is an earth-resounding, they shall not pass. And though Franco won, you were forced into exile. You never lost hope in the goodness of man. You, that sustaining thought in your conscience makes you a saint in my heart. By foot across the Pyrenees, you escaped into France. Then you flew to Moscow, where you met your two children and began a new life in the USSR. In 1942, when Hitler launched a major offensive into southern Russia, your son Reuben sacrificed his life fighting against the Nazis in the Battle of Stalingrad. I'm sorry for your pain, Passionaria, and grateful for your heart. You outlived Franco and were able to return to your beloved Spain 39 years later, holding your, high, her, your head high, your heart open, and your eyes as crystal clear as your soul. There is so much I've not mentioned of your perilous life around your town growing up, but your autobiography details it so well that at times it reminded me of characters in Ulysses with you as the pacifist voyaging to freedom. Thank you. Wow. That was passionate, beautiful, incredibly well written. I applaud you. Thank you. It's, it's really from the heart. I can see that. I, when I think about her, I want to cry. Right. And it's, I think, because of what we're going through. Right. It's All relevant to now. In her country right. and throughout the world. I mean, just this morning, I heard in the news what's going on in Germany. Mm -hmm. Did you hear about it? I did not. Like 25 people were caught. Uh, Oh, the fascists who right, are trying right, right. To, to, to storm yes. the, the government right. in Germany and take over. And it's happening all over. And I just, I, I, I really strongly believe that fascism is ill-intended. Right. It's not like, oh, you know, we want to do well and, you know, we're just, we happen to do bad because we have to. No, it's it's actually ill intended and it's basically evil yeah, yeah. and as an artist mm -hmm. 
I feel that we need to we need to um, stick together and communicate these ideas so that we can uh, encourage right, right. Um, everyone to become more aware of truths of facts and that we can do what we can in our own small way. You just uh, read this, uh, wrote this recently? Or is this something you've been I working did, on? I did, Pete, when mm -hmm. you invited me to come here. Is this something you wanted to I, do for, for it a just long came, time? When I wrote you, mm -hmm. and I said, Pete, can I, can I share a story? And you said yes. That's when I began writing. Wow. Because it, it, it seems like something that would take a long time to write. I, I know. It's so I'm descriptive. really a slow writer. I, I'm so slow. I've taken like... 10 years and I haven't finished this novel but this became this was like 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 it just came out of me right and um, I mean did it require a lot of research or this is something uh, no this is it a, did require research yeah, and be. I love research right. I mean just yesterday I was reading about because one thing leads to another right mm -hmm. you go okay wait like when when did Hitler take over or, or how did Hitler take over? You know, like things start like, like, and and I start like listening to either podcasts or YouTube, still, you know, documentaries, and I go, oh, so the elite, you know, they they saw that there was dem democracy mm -hmm. was winning, and so you know, so things start making sense, and it's all history repeats itself, right? Right. And so, yeah, it's the, it, there's research done, but it's also been research that I've kind of grown up with right. because of that documentary I started making because of my father. I mean, I my father used to, I used to sit on his on his lap and he used to cry, telling me about how he never had a chance to go to school and he was barefoot and he was a you know a, a result of the bombing of Guernica and the Spanish Civil War. And, and as a little girl looking at him crying, I think that that really hit me. So is your family, so your family lineage is Spain, but y you were born in Colombia? Well, my mother is from Colombia. I see. Her father is also Basque. Mm -hmm. ha, um, his last name is Goyeneche. But my father at age, I think 21, went to Colombia with a bunch of his friends from Guernica looking for a way to survive. Okay. And um, some of his friends were bakers. They they have really good bakeries in the Basque I country. Bet. I bet. And so he opened some bakery. He he opened a bakery and in Bogota, Colombia and really did really well. And there my mother would go and mm -hmm. have her little pastry and okay. that's how they met. Nice. That's a great story. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that is a good story. And how did then and then my father says that during the war or after the war, the way he escaped was going to see Hollywood movies. Huh. So he's an expert in, you know, uh, Spencer Tracy and Ava Gardner, <laughs> okay. and, you right, know, right, all right. these all these movies, Burt Lancaster, and you know. So I think that he was like drawn to Hollywood because of all the movies he had seen and family members of on my mother's side had also moved to Hollywood. So So that's the connection. It made no sense to <laughs> me. And I, I still there are moments I go, Dad, but you were doing well in Bogota. You were making a lot of money. But I think that also it's kinda like, you know, never have made money and suddenly making a lot of money. It was like Oh, where do I go now? You right, know. Right. Right. So he moved to Hollywood. Is that what first you we moved to back to Guernica? Okay. And we were there for like two years, and then he changed How his mind. How old you? Uh, I was two. Oh, okay. Two right. to four. Right. But, but then he sent me off back to Colombia when I was nine, and then they, my parents, and then I went to the Basque country to Guernica when I was eleven, and I've been back and forth all my life. Okay. I, I've never, I, and I don't feel like I belong of any one place. Okay. I feel like everywhere I'm like, oh, well, La Americana. You belong, you, oh. belong, you belong there, though. That's you, inside of you, this history, rich history and culture, correct? Yeah, yeah. And um, so how did, how did the acting thing happen for you? Because is, is it because your father loved it? Mm, um, maybe. Uh, movies? But or? I think that at age six... I think I was six when we moved to Hollywood. And I think that just living literally like off of Hollywood Boulevard, 
on Carlos Street in front of the Presbyterian Church, like Carlos, I think it was Carlos and Gower. We would walk to school every day. My mother would walk us to school, Selma, and, um, and then we went to Cherimoya on Franklin. And I think it was just, I, 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 don't, I don't know, I think it was being surrounded by, by that energy. Mm-hmm. I started dreaming of, of acting, and at age nine, I did my first film. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I played the lead in the first film, but then they m- sent me off to Columbia. So I was always like interrupted. Right. My, 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 my vision was always interrupted and I had to like learn to play, you know, move with, with whatever change. But do you think that um, informed the rest of your life where you seem to be somebody who is, um, is a go-getter and has done a lot of different things? Is that Yeah, it did inform me. Yeah. It, it did. It made me um, flexible mm-hmm. and tolerant and will- of whatever. And willing to take chances? Willing, yeah. to, take, willing <laughs> to take chances and, and also a little na- naive because I would come to, like, I would return to the States, but I wasn't culturally aware of what shows were on TV or what was going on or I wouldn't watch. I was like you know, ignorant to some things. And it worked in my favor because I wasn't like starstruck. Right. Like so many times I auditioned for people who I didn't know who they were. Like I, when I auditioned for Carol O'Connor, I didn't know who he was. Huh. Okay. Uh, which is ridiculous. Right. You know? <laughs> and so I spoke to him like regular Joe. Like right. I just, and I think he liked that. Yeah, probably. You know? Right. And he goes, I yeah. want to work with someone like that. Right. It's, what did you so do with him? I played a rookie, a cop. Oh. In, uh, in New York City, okay. in a pilot for a series, I would you know it didn't go, but it was uh, he was it was both of us mm-hmm. in, in the cop car. Okay, you know? it was really <laughs> it was fun, it was fun. It was a two hour pilot. Do you like that? Um, so you you acted for quite a long time, but it seems like um, what you're doing now is more uh, writing. Uh, you've directed yeah pieces. Um, you've done plays. Um, yeah, are they very different? Uh, cultural or, or artistic yeah. type of... Um, I think it's because um, acting was always kind of like trying to put me in a box. In Hollywood. In Hollywood. Right. And I was willing to do it at first because I found, I found it very challenging and wonderful. But then when I started seeing like, wait a minute, there you don't want to see me like they just want to see me like this i started getting a little bored right you got pigeonholed yeah i started going wait a minute i'm not inspired it must be hard to break that in hollywood it is so hard i mean i turned down down and out in beverly hills because it was the second it would be the second time to play a maid right a latina maid who's like you know screwing the boss it was like i didn't want to play these roles and and it's and not, I, I just want to. I'm a curious person, and I want to. I want to be. I want to be amazed. I want to be. I want to be enlightened. I want to be interested. And to play these roles, you have to play dumb. Right. And I didn't want to play dumb. I wanted to play dumb for a little bit and get all the humanity out of that. Like, you know, playing Delta Force too. Somebody just sent me a, vid- a copy, a photo, because it was aired or it was on TV in Spain like two nights ago. But I don't mind doing that for a little bit, but you can't, you can't sacrifice your life for fame to play these roles. And change, times have changed mm-hmm. enormously. I mean, now I don't think it's the same. But when I was younger, it was a little bit like that. It well, was, spe- it was spe- hard. Especially um, Hollywood's not always cr- um, the best for women. Yeah. And then uh, non-Americans. Right. 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 Yeah. They, they want to just, you know, they just want to put everybody in one place. But then it also becomes very divisive because I remember in L.A. having Mexican friends who said, Begonia, you know, I love you and I'm going to direct this film, but you're not Mexican. Mm-hmm. Or here, Puerto Ricans. You know, yeah, you don't, you know, you're not the Puerto Rican. And it just becomes like, when I first returned to the States, when I was like six, six 17, I was like, oh, 
hola, you know, I was talking to Sp in Spanish to everybody, and it was like, oh, I don't want, you huh. know, like they were embarrassed, and I was huh. going, what's going on? Like, I wasn't aware of all the prejudice going right. on, and I wasn't aware of, like, you had to maintain a certain place. It was, it's very interesting, but that's the way I, the world But from, from an artist's point of view, it must have been very frustrating. It was, yeah, it was frustrating. So I moved to New York, and I did theater. I studied with Geraldine Page, Uta Hagen, uh, Herbert Berghoff, uh, Geraldine, you know, mm -hmm. Michael Howard. I, I studied with a lot of people. I studied dance at Alvin Ailey like, for two years. I studied voice, and I was just, I, 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 perhaps I admire so much Passionaria because in, in my own small way, I needed to improve my own self. You know, I studied at Shakespeare Company, repertory company. I I needed to improve myself sure. in order to to prove to others, right, that I can act uh, many different roles, not just right. you know the maid or the whore. That, that must be really <laughs> frustrating, I would imagine. <laughs> and you're. Uh, an educated, smart woman, then you probably don't want to, you want to branch out and do things that yeah. require more. Yeah, uh, curiosity. You, that story is very vivid. Um, I, if, I was almost like closing my eyes and thinking it was like a, listening to a movie. Uh, is that a potential that would idea? That amazing. <laughs> if somebody could, you know, I, I don't know if I could get into that now, but if right. somebody was interested, wow, that would be... That would be amazing. That would be an honor, and that would be the right thing to do for this woman. I can't. I've never heard of who I represents mean, so she much. She did so much. It's crazy. What a life! Can you imagine yeah. losing four kids, having oh nothing to eat? All of this. I mean, you know, sometimes I imagine. I imagine. I go. I can't imagine it. But yeah, even here in the states, the people are suffering hunger. Sure. People are, y you know, are stuck in places. And I hope that people are inspired to g grab a book, grab knowledge, and become interested in the world around them and not blame, not mm -hmm. become victims. I think that that's an example that she you know, gives us. Well, I hope this story gets published. Are you going to work oh, on trying to you. do that? Yeah, I would love to. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many places say, well, if you've already read it or if it's already done, really? that we're not interested. Huh. So. Well, that's crazy. <laughs> I know. So, uh, so know. Uh, you, you do so much. What Right now, what's the most important to you from an, as an artist? As um, an artist, it's, um, it, it, it's writing. Okay. It's writing, uh, reading, um, learning things, um, uh, just... Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I haven't been so preoccupied with like getting out there mm -hmm. because I feel like I'm, I'm growing so much. I, I mean, you don't understand, Pete. I, I have taught myself how to write just through practice, right. it's just through just doing it over and over again. I mm -hmm. have so many drafts of this novel. And I mean, I wrote a screenplay and that c came out pretty good because I think of my acting experience. That was quick, and mm -hmm. that was in. It what got was the screenplay for? Um, Salvador Dali. It was a year in the life of Gala and mm -hmm. Salvador Dali, um, from the eyes of a lover. Wow. Okay. And it was pretty cool, and I and I I was never bored with Salvador Dali and Gala because he touches upon so many subjects, from science to the mystical to to art to psychology i mean he was he was so i was r really entertained with him but um but then oh i don't know uh if you've seen but on youtube philip jambri mm -hmm. read a short story yes yeah from that all that novel that i wrote right uh i have this one little gem and it's uh the story read by philip if it wasn't for philip i wouldn't know you Exactly. Right. Thank you. We both, re we both you, read at, uh, uh, at his. Uh, He's book such an amazing party. man. Yeah. I love him. If it wasn't for Philip, I wouldn't be writing poetry. Right. I mean, he literally like called me up and said, uh, "Begonia, you know, why don't you come and read some poetry?" And I go, "I have, I haven't read poet, I read <laughs> written poetry, right. and I, I can't write poetry." Right. He goes, "Yes, you can." Huh. Right. And I was like, "Okay, okay. let me give it a try." And you did it. Well, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. And I think the music, right? You're a musician, uh, Pete. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, music helps, right? Your yeah. ear. The, 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 a lot of my uh, poetry is um, influenced by music. Yeah. The subject of music and, it's, and just have experienced music all my life. Yeah, it's a very deep connection. I guess for you, would it would also would it be the you know acting and filmmaking, or does that come out in your writing at all? Because it's storytelling. Yeah, it's storytelling. Yeah, yeah, and just and I have to say, I love the artist. I watched the the piece, you, the short, the oh, short you film did? you did. It's fantastic. Oh, Tell me a little you. bit about that. Um, is it the one? Um, the, it's like a day in the life of an. Of, a of, day in yeah, the life. That's my ex husband. Oh, I didn't. I know married that. a painter. Okay. A wonderful painter in Barcelona. Um, I had gone to Barcelona to do a, a series um, for CBS, playing the lead, and um, uh, I had already dated Chano, and then we broke up, and then I would go to Barcelona, and then we get back together. Mm -hmm. And during the the filming of this, the first season, um, things are not great. Um, from Catalans are picketing, saying that I'm not Catalan. Huh. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm wow. no, I don't belong anywhere. Uh -huh. So picketing, I'm not Catalan, I'm, and I'm supposed to, you know, CBS is supposed to have a, spa, a Catalan. And uh, to, you know, even a bad experience with the other actors. It huh. was just not, they were not nice. And, um, and I worked with a lot of other actors who have al always been amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't. I, I can't say anything bad about anyone, but that particular experience motivated me to perhaps kind of turn my back a little bit on Hollywood and say, oh, okay, let's focus on a relationship right. and, and, and another world and, and things like that. So my daughter was born in Barcelona, and um, I mean, we moved around a little bit. We, I came to New York and um, auditioned for Man of La Mancha on Broadway, and like after my third audition, I found out I was pregnant. So wow. that stopped the oh. whole thing. <laughs> Don't you love it? Yeah. When you get like these fastballs. Right. Well, <laughs> women have that you. extra, you know. Yeah. Thing so to then we moved back to Barcelona, uh -huh. and um, so um, eventually we separated, but we stayed friends. And I was always carrying a camera, and and I thought this would be an interesting little story. The artist, you right. know, a, I, a I day in the, the life, right. and and my daughter's going to school there. So, so was your daughter yeah. in that too? Yeah. Okay. See, I didn't know one. that. Yeah. I, I didn't yeah. know that was actual. Yeah, it's family. actually. Fam <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had the feeling of it though. Yeah. 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 Oh, that was great. Yeah. Tell me what. So this went really fast. I feel like I could talk to you for another oh, hour. Me too. Maybe we'll have to do it again sometime. Tell me what's important to you moving forward. Well, um, uh, just uh, I think family is really important for me right now, and I love I love I love my life right now in New York uh, with my husband, and um, and just writing and and just you know I I, I really appreciate um, relationships and love and my daughters and in Spain and my parents are in Spain so I go visit them and um, and just letting things progress right and being um, being in the moment being uh, creative staying creative for me is very important to stay creative I think it's um, it, it represents um, wholeness represents joy it represents uh, being aware of the world we're living in and I just totally being, agree with you. Yeah, you feel it's, it's it's human. Yeah, and yeah. just and coming Humanity. here and being here with you and 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 doing this is so special. Um, Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about um, the literary arcade on YouTube? Oh, I, I just started the literary arcade, and um, I've had two readings, uh, different people's uh, stories. Um, Juan Sanchez, uh, John Sanchez has one, and then Charlie Fish is another. And I just thought, you know, let me just, like you, mm -hmm. Peter, it's like, let me just start something where I can bring other writers together and we can start reading and, and sharing and, and just kind of like uh, fostering, right? right? That's kind of what, I, what I'm trying to get out of this, yeah. is yeah. getting uh, a chance for not only hearing people's 
uh, creativity, hear what they're uh, writing or their, what their stories are, but to find out about the, themselves. Right. If you go to a, um, an open mic or even a feature, you only hear the the words that the writer is speaking, but exactly. you don't know the person. Right. And I think there's a important connection Absolutely. to the two things. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So what is uh, your plan, too, continuing to do this? Well, I, um, I have one book out. <laughs> Which I don't want to talk too much about. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. What's the title of it? It's called Bitter Pill: Two Shots and a Piece of Cake. And uh, I have uh, a second book. I uh, love it. Congratulations. Thanks. That came out in May. This is hard. This is hard to do. (laughs) Congratulations. And then I have a second one, pretty much lined up, uh, probably released next year. I've been working with musicians, and my uh, hope is to do an album with my poetry and music. So those are my goals for next year. Great. Great. (laughs) So unfortunately, and you're married? I am married. My wife, uh, Jill, um, is a graphic designer. I have a son. Uh, he's 19. 19. Yeah. Cool. Ooh. And uh, so they're a big part of, of what I do. Yeah. I hate to say this. this we're is, done? We're, oh, yeah, we're at the end of the Thank show. Thank you. Um, you've this been a fascinating guest. Such a pleasure. I think, we, we, well, next year we'll have to do a, yeah, a part two. <laughs> yeah, okay. And you got to come to my show. Of course. Okay. I will definitely do that. So, okay. So, um, Thank you for being a great guest. Thank um, you. This has been um, Storytelling on Orchard Street. And um, I'm your host, Pete Salamita. And thank you all for listening. And thank you, Begonia, so much for, for being a fascinating person to talk to. Thank you. Thank you.